You have heard it said. Once more, we join Jesus on the mountainside where he's teaching the gathered crowd about what it means to be a follower of God. Once more, we hear Jesus talk about the laws and the rules that the people have read and heard, and he interprets them a little differently. He doesn't change them. Instead, he casts light on them to show us a new way to understand them. Once more, we read the words of Jesus who shared his goal to change the world, not through violent insurrection, but by a life of love and service. Once more, we read the hard words of Jesus, words that teach us who to love and how to love. And it's not an easy command. Let us pray. God of us all, your love never fails even when our love does. We pray, O God, that you would open our minds and our hearts and our eyes, that we might see who you love, that we might join you in loving them. Speak through me, O God, that my words may be yours, and speak to each of us, that we might hear your message for us this day. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How many of you have enemies? A few of you say yes. My daughter and I had quite the conversation about who her enemies are. I don't have enemies. I mean, the last good enemy I had was that girl that tried to take my boyfriend in high school. And spoiler alert, neither one of us ended up with him and I'm the better for it. I haven't had an enemy since I stopped going to high school sports. You know what I mean, right? My high school football team wasn't winning any state champions at the time, but we had winning seasons every year, beating all of our rivalries. Football was king and rivalries were a thing. You didn't think about having a kind thought about somebody from Perry, (laughs) or worse yet, Monticello. They were the enemy. College sports was even worse. We lived halfway between Tallahassee and Gainesville in the middle of Seminole and Gator territory. Huge rivals, enemies even. Once there was a booth set up at our high school homecoming parade. They had this big old thing with the, and this booth had an old car. Half of it painted Seminole colors, half of it painted um, Gator colors. You could pay to beat the car with a sledgehammer on the side you didn't like. Anybody seen this before? Yeah, yeah, it's a thing. It's a thing. They made lots of money. This rivalry extended to any other college team that wasn't your college team. One Sunday, a smiling mom walked into the nursery with her toddler. She was old enough to walk, but not quite talking very much. She was dressed to look like a cheerleader from her mom's um, football team. And mom proudly said, watch this. She said, go Gators. And the baby said, yay! (laughs) Gets better. Then she said, Georgia Bulldogs. And the baby said, (laughs) Enemies. Enemies. This is what I grew up with. You'll be happy to know, by the way, that this baby grew up to be a very successful and well-adjusted graduate of her mother's University of Florida. (laughs) Is this what Jesus is talking about when he says, love your enemies? Maybe. We should have such love for people that when somebody says, go Gators, we can say, yay. We should have so much love for people that when somebody says, go Lumberjacks, we can say, yay even if they didn't win last night. I'm married to a lumberjack. Jesus says, love your enemies. In our passage this morning, Jesus invited a radical rethinking of how we are to treat the world around us. While we may not have true enemies in our world, there are times and places that it's hard to act in love to those around us. Jesus teaches his followers to love without limits. Jesus teaches us to love without limits. Love is how the world will be saved. Love is how you and I and our enemies will be saved. 
Now, Jesus was not ignoring the very real abuse and pain that the Jewish people of his time lived with. Their land was occupied by the Romans and had been for about 600 years. They had lived with evil and injustice as they were forced to pay taxes and follow laws enacted by the occupying forces. They lived with evil and injustice far more than most of us do today. There were people, there were some of the Jewish community who believed that insurgency was the way to go, and so multiple times the people tried to rise up against the Roman Empire with force. Didn't go well, as you might imagine. In the midst of it, Jesus sat down on a mountainside and told his followers that you can defeat evil in a different way. He told his followers that the way to defeat evil was with love, He told his followers that the way to break the cycle of violence and oppression was with love. He told his followers to be a force for good, not a force against evil. We see it begin with his teaching about retribution. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In order to understand this, we go back to the Torah, to the first five books of the Bible. In Exodus 21, the people were told to simply react in kind, an eye for an eye. In Leviticus 24, they're told that if someone injures you, you can injure him back, tooth for a tooth. And what will the world get? As Tevye from Fiddler on the Roof says, the whole world will be blind and toothless. The thing is, this was actually a very radical teaching that we find in both Leviticus and Exodus. There was the habit of retribution that was vengeful, not simple retribution. If someone took out your eye, you killed their family. Someone killed your cow, burned down the town. Instead, God told the Israelites that vengeance wasn't necessary. Only respond as you've been wronged. That sets you apart from those around you. By the time Jesus came around, there were other rabbis who were teaching that violence wasn't good in any circumstance. The Talmud, the collection of Jewish writings that interpreted the law given in the Torah, began to teach that it was the value of an eye for an eye, or the value of a tooth for a tooth. The the Talmud develops a comprehensive set of standards for compensation, taking into account damages and pain and medical expenses, incapacitation and mental anguish, contributing to the foundation of many modern legal codes. It is into this that Jesus steps up. Jesus reinterpreted the law to suggest a different way. Jesus taught that if someone hit you across the cheek, give him the other cheek. If someone took your outer garment, give him your inner one too. If someone requires you to do something, go above and beyond. Jesus is telling the powerless to stand up to the powerful. Many people have echoed this teaching. Nonviolent resistance became the way of Martin Luther King Jr. and those who followed him in the civil rights movement. He learned from Mahatma Gandhi, who was a pioneer of the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence. But like Gandhi taught, nonviolence didn't mean doormat. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. He didn't say, be a doormat. What he is suggesting is actually a slightly passive action. Give up more. Do more than what you're asked. In Johannesburg, Bishop Desmond Tutu was walking along an elevated wooden sidewalk. As he neared, as he neared a narrow section of the walkway, a white man approached from the other direction and said, Get off the sidewalk. I don't make way for gorillas. Tutu stepped aside, gestured broadly, and said, I do. Mother Teresa, accompanied by a hungry child, once entered a bakery, at which time the baker spat upon her face. She calmly responded, thank you for that gift to me. Do you have anything for the child? These were the powerless in society, turning the other cheek, but not being passive, responding instead in love. 
Jesus told his followers, Jesus tells us to defeat evil in a different way. Be a force for good, not a force against evil. This is how Jesus believes that we will break the, the cycle of violence and oppression. To do that, we don't seek retribution. Evil is not overcome by a stronger version of evil. Hate is not overcome with more hate. Darkness does not overcome darkness. Only the light can do that, to paraphrase Martin Luther King. Jesus tells us we can break the cycle. Christians are called to be Christ-like, to counter evil with good, to allow Christ to live through us. Christians are called to love. Love is what breaks that cycle. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Love is what will change the world. It is so much easier to retaliate, isn't it? It's easier to strike back, to hold a grudge, to think bad thoughts about that other person. It's easier to go onto social media and ridicule the other person, to deepen the divide between you and the person that you're at odds with. It's super easy to go onto social media and post anything you want without thought of whether or not we're loving. It's easier to retaliate, to wish ill for that company that didn't treat you right when they were fixing your stucco. It's easier to retaliate, to say unkind words, about the person that you disagree with. It's easier to retaliate, to bear grudges against that Democrat, that Republican, that Independent that you don't agree with. But Jesus said that we are to counter evil with good. Allow Christ to live through us. Cross the divide and lovingly serve the other people in your life, your enemies, those you just don't like. And the good news is Jesus isn't all talk and no action. Jesus doesn't just teach this, but he models it. He models crossing the divide and lovingly serving his enemies as he gave his life for everyone, even those who decided to strike out as his enemy. When we come to the communion table, we remember how he modeled the love he asks of us in his death and in his resurrection. So what do we do with all this? There's the obvious answer. As we start college football season, we allow people to cheer for their own football team and not make enemies of them. But there's more than that. We break the cycle of anger and retribution with your estranged sister or brother. Break the cycle with your spouse or your child Break the cycle with that person at work or your neighbor. With God's help, you can act in love and be the different one. With God's help, you can be Christ-like to counter evil with good to allow Christ to live through you. With God's help, you can love. Extreme evil demands extreme good as a response. It requires more than just a nominal effort. That's true for our personal lives, and it's true as a church. Jesus invites the church today to break the cycle of violence and retribution. We are called as a church to turn the other cheek, to give our cloak, to go a second mile. What does that look like? How do we do that as a church? To answer that, we have to start with who are our enemies. To be honest, the church has enemies inside and out, those who want us to fail and those who, want to, who work against us so that we will fail. We have those within and without the church that want us to be like we used to be or like we ought to be or like they think we should be. How can we pray for those who persecute us, those who say bad things about us, those who can't forgive us for what Christianity has done for them? We're called to be the church. That means more than sending get well cards. That means more than sending the pastor to do a hospital visit. That means more than simply attending Sunday school. All of these are good things, but they aren't the radical love that Jesus offered the world. These aren't the things that will change the world, that will make news, that will make others sit up and notice 
us, our advertising and our concert series are good things, but they aren't changing the world very fast. How can we do church in such a way that people want to be part of us? How do we change the world with our love? How do we live in such a way that people want to be part of us? How do we live in such a way that people want us to, su to succeed, to be part of the amazing things that we're doing? You and I, we are called to break the cycle of violence and retribution, both here at the church and in our personal lives. And only do, does that happen when we love. Who does Jesus tell us to love? It's easy to love those who look like us, who act like us, who think like us. It's easy for us to love our neighbors, our families, most of the time. Jesus tells us, love your enemies. Love those who don't agree with you. Love those who are hard to love. Love everyone. This morning as we come to the table, to have communion together, I invite you to consider, who is your enemy? Maybe you wouldn't call them that. Who do you have a grudge against? Who can you not, not forgive? Who do you not agree with? Who is your enemy? Who do you need to love? Think about someone who you need to love a whole lot more. Ask God to make the way clear for you to break the cycle and to reach out in love. Let us pray. Oh God, your love never fails. We are grateful that you love us at our worst and at our best. You love us when we are lovable and we, when we are hard to get along with. God, show us how we might change this world with your love. Show us how we might break the cycle of violence and retribution, the cycle of anger and judgment, the cycle that leads to more evil, and instead be a church and a people who love. We don't always know what that looks like, but we trust your nudging. We trust that you are inviting us. We trust that we can change this world for you as we love this world around us. Show us your way. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.